So Worlds Collide was great. All the NXT folks that participated in the Royal Rumble were great. Some pushed more than others, but whatever. It is what it is. Portland already looks great. And we've got Shotzi Blackheart in a fucking tank. Let's talk about it. But first, a word from the good people over at What Culture. Uh, if you want to listen to a podcast that really is truly the tightest worldwide, make sure you check out the Spaz Phoenix podcast. It's bloody brilliant, mate. That's me, bloody, Billy Bloody Cake, but me, Payton Bloody Royce, saying listen to the Spaz Phoenix podcast because it's absolutely iconic. What's going on, everybody? It's your buddy, it's your Pals Phoenix, the YWC Reality Check, here with your January 29th, 2020 NXT review. And you guys know the drill. We're going to do the house cleaning out of the way first. First bit of house cleaning isn't even about me, isn't even about this channel. I want to send a quick shout out to my buddy, OK Fabe, over on the OK Fabe show, over on Fight. Apparently, he's got a chance to interview Alicia Atu this week on his show. Now, Alicia Atu, most people I think might know her from MLW, which I'm not particularly familiar with. I know she just signed on with them as a, I don't know whether she's an interview person or a ring announcer or a backstage personality, but she signed on with them. I met her, big surprise, surprise, at a Destiny show. She, the grand total of one time that I got a chance to meet her, she was an absolute sweetheart. She was very cool when uh, when she was at Destiny. Uh, I think that's a really cool get for uh, for Connor, for OK Fabe, my buddy who has been on this channel, does uh, do a little bit here and there to help out this channel and, uh, you know, retweet my stuff, etc. If you haven't checked out Connor, check out what he's doing not only on YouTube by, uh, I think it's uh, youtube.com slash okfaber, but you can find him, I believe it's it's either Friday or Sunday at 9 o'clock, the OK Fabe show over on uh, over on the Fight TV app, but he's going to be interviewing Alicia Atu. I'm going to be tuning in. I thought I'd share that with you guys as well. Also, go back one video, and speaking of Destiny, you'll hear me talk about the next show they've got coming up, which is called Bad Intentions, March 22nd, um, here at, here in Mississauga at the Don Koloff Arena. I go into more detail it in the previous video, but basically the crux of it is brand new NXT Cruiserweight Champion Jordan Devlin, along with Trent Seven and Tyler Bate, are all returning slash debuting, in the case of uh, Jordan Devlin, uh, for that show, in, at, for, uh, for Bad Intentions here in Mississauga, and that's really cool. Uh, none of their opponents have been announced. Literally none of their opponents have been announced. Also, uh, Channing Decker versus Red Death is the first official match announced for that card. More information will come as it comes. Obviously, there's other champions to be, uh, to be seen to there. Obviously, uh, Kevin Blackwood, uh, Josh Alexander, etc., etc., etc. Speaking of Destiny, we're going to talk about Shotzi Blackheart later on down the line in this particular show, but if you are watching me, or sorry, if you are listening to me in an audio form and you want to find me on YouTube, you want to go on YouTube, search Spaz Phoenix. If you are watching me on YouTube right now, seeing my pretty sexy face and the gimmick hat, you want to find me in an audio platform, go to Stitcher, Spotify, iTunes, Google, TuneIn, iHeartRadio, uh, Breaker, CastBox, Radio Public, Pocket Cast, Spreaker, Castro, Anchor.fm, Player.fm, Overcast, and Listen Notes. Put in Spaz Phoenix Podcast, you will find the audio version of this as well. Go back, uh, about a week and a half ago, you'll see all my highlights from the last, from the last Destiny show, which was called Carnage. I was calling it Carnage 6, because it was the 6th anniversary, ra da ra Go back, and even though it's a little bit outdated now, you can hear myself and Super Sexy Jake DeMarco talking about Worlds Collide before it happened. Uh, that video got a lot of uh, good response. A lot of love from the Joe Cronin show, uh, JCS Army, so uh, I really do appreciate all you guys, and all you guys have been joining me on the NXT live streams. If this is your first time checking this out, you can check out this live stream. The NXT live stream goes out Thursday nights at 7 p.m. my time. I'm in the Toronto time zone. You can figure that shit out for yourself. We uh, we surpassed 1,000 subs. We're working towards 2,000, 2,000 by the end of this year. 
pretty reasonable goal in my opinion. I know I've got a lot of people out there. The the girls from the Pinups and Pinfalls uh, podcast have been sharing my stuff out. Shell from the JCS Army, along with guys like Connor and Joe and Jake, and you guys have been fantastic. Uh, it shows in my numbers, which are small but growing, and you're all pretty fucking awesome. You know what else is pretty fucking awesome? The January 29th episode of NXT, because I've rambled for almost five minutes already. We start off, as we always do, with a video package bringing you up to date on what's going on with the brand. We saw a video package on what happened last week, uh, how we got to the Dusty Finals, Keith Lee winning the North American Championship, everything going on in the women's division, and we... Uh, we sort of push forward. We talk about Worlds Collide and the Royal Rumble later on. Uh, we do. We have a quick aside with commentary, talking uh, Mauro Ronaldo addressing Beth Phoenix, talking about what a harrowing week they've had between her uh, participation in the women's Royal Rumble, uh, where she got her head fucked up in that match. Like she, the Crimson Mask was the Crimson wig. That doesn't work at all, does it? But more importantly, and, and more of a headline, would be her husband, Edge, the Hall of Famer, coming back. And I could do a whole video on Edge's return. I did a video when he retired, and I was pretty morose and not very animated. And it's probably not a good video if I go back and look at it now. But obviously, her participation in the Women's Rumble was a surprise. It was cool to see her step away from her commentary gig that she's very good at and come back. I mean, there's always the um, there's always the pull that she's going to get together with Natalia and they're going to have a run with those tag titles. But I think that's the only thing... I, and I don't mean this in a bad way because I love what she does on NXT. I think that's the only thing I want to see her do in ring is if her and Natalia uh, get a run with those, with those tag titles because... I'm not going to lie, Natalia is great in the ring, she's got all the skills in the world, and from everything that we've heard, she's a great mentor in the back, much like Beth Phoenix, but there's nothing about what they have her doing or what she does that's that's exciting or engaging to me, so I would almost rather have her effects be felt in a backstage role, bringing forward all these new talents than see her on my screen, and there's no way for me to say that that doesn't sound disrespectful, but please believe me when I say I don't mean it in a disrespectful way. Beth Phoenix is obviously not going to wrestle a full-time schedule, but if they brought the Divas of Doom back together uh, and had one quick run with the women's tag titles, I think you could not only have fun with that, but you could add a little bit of extra prestige and uh, nostalgia to those titles that are, I believe... They're, I mean, if, if you want to count the, the belts that have been rebranded recently, but I think they're still some of the newest titles in the WWE other than the 24-7 title. We don't talk about the 24-7 title. Mojo Rawley and Riddick Moss have the 24-7 title right now. Let's just, let's just not talk about it. Let's just not talk about it. But it was cool that they did that because they really did avoid... Um, sort of Renee Young syndrome in the sense of, you know, Corey Graves. As much as I like Corey Graves, and Corey Graves gets a lot of bad stick from a lot of people, um, listening to him and Renee Young constantly needling each other when Ambrose was coming to the end of his contract was a bit much. And you couldn't ignore, for fans like us that watch, the, you know, the follow the behind the scenes crap and read the dirt sheets and rowdy rowdy rah, know that Renee Young is married to Dean Ambrose and now John Moxley and it's a work. It's fine. Um... The same thing goes for Beth Phoenix and Edge. I mean, they were very highly touted at the time for being the first WWE couple to be like dual Hall of Fame inductees. So it, it was, it wasn't insulting to the fan base because we didn't we didn't hark on it all night, but we addressed it. We got it out of the way right away. And Beth Phoenix herself said, "Okay, guys, that's enough about me and and my family. Let's get back to the to the business at hand." And the business at hand was Finn Balor. I'm sorry, my nose is itchy as it always is. Don't watch the videos. Go find this past Phoenix podcast. It's fine. Um, Finn Balor versus Trent Seven. And how did we get here? We got here because Finn Balor had his great match with Ilya Dragunov on the weekend. But more to the point, DIY had a fucking classic with Mustache Mountain. That was really, really good. Made me, selfishly, look forward to seeing Mustache Mountain at the at the Destiny show. And I'm gonna I'm gonna stop cheap plugging that uh, never because it's gonna be a lot of fun and I wish more people were around and more people could come and enjoy it with me. That would be awesome. But Finn Balor having uh, more than one iron in the fire at once attacked Johnny Gargano backstage after both of their respective matches, uh, Mustache Mountain, you know, face versus face tag team, you know, mutual respect or whatever, they tried to get involved and whatever, and then apparently, apparently, uh, Finn Balor 
found Trent Seven in a parking lot and tried to close the door on his throat and, and threatened him a bunch and said, I work Wednesdays, I'll see you when I see you, and they had the match. And they, they really, really teed this up really well, that he's going to have problems with his throat the whole goddamn match. And it starts when uh, Trent Seven, he's, he looks he looks haggard. And I'm, I know I, I always say that Trent Seven is like the old guy of Mustache Mountain. And it's, again, it's like the Beth Phoenix thing. It's not meant in any derogatory way, but he is. And the way he was like sort of creeping towards the ring, not quite ready to do that thing where he's got the towel around his neck and they roll into the bottom rope and then they throw the towel at the top rope and it makes everybody pop but like he got dropped off the apron by Balor because Balor's like fuck that shit uh mud hole stomp on the floor mud hole stomp in the ring choke over the ropes by Balor springboard stomps to the chest Jeez, he has him down on the ground you know when they, they do the thing and it's and it's purely stage work and it's not accurate at all but it's basically holding the top rope bouncing off the bottom rope stepping on the chest up on the rope back down, up on the rope, back down, baseball drop kick out of the ring and onto the guardrail, like guardrail choke, like, you know, see, you do the hangman on the ropes, and we know that there's actual rope in those ropes, as, as tacky as that sounds, but the hangman is is a debilitating enough move on its own, but to see him do the hangman over the guardrail was, eh. seated neck vice by Balor working on the neck, double stomp to the ribs, which, you know, if your throat's fucked up, you can't breathe. If you, your throat's fucked up and somebody's standing on your ribs, you definitely can't fucking breathe, which is great. Running elbows by Balor, but a surprise small package by uh, Trent Seven is like the first little breath, no pun intended, in the match. Both men trade some chops, a sling blade by Balor. Sling blade on a fucked up neck would fucking wreck, wouldn't it? A uh, series of Irish whip chop combinations by Balor and a face buster, a choke on the rope and a modified sleeper by Balor working the throat. Shots to the back by Seven as he gets himself back up, a backdrop driver and a DDT. Uh, can't read my own writing. There's a double boot by Balor, a snapdragon by Trent Seven. Now, somebody who's had their neck worked on let alone their shoulder, rib cage area, and head, shouldn't be doing anything where they themselves have to lean backwards. But the Snapdragon, I'm sorry, Kenny Omega, the uh, the Snapdragon snu suplex by Trent Seven is fucking great because it doesn't look clean. I get it. Kenny Omega has his fans, and they like the nice, clean, crisp, you know, we, we get up and we do it all over again thing. But when Trent Seven does it, because he's a little bit of a bigger dude, a little bit of an older dude, it looks ugly when he does it, and ugly looks painful, and it makes it work. Uh, seven Star Larry and a tackle off the apron and a suicide dive, but a snake eyes on the bottom rope, a shotgun dropkick, a coup de gras, and a 1916 back to back to back to back to back gets the win for Balor. And I thought we were going to get a run in by bait. Now, here's the thing much respect as I just had for Trent Seven. After I saw the run in, that these guys all had at Worlds Collide. You can go back, you can follow me on Twitter, at SpazPhoenix1. I said, the very first thing I want to see coming out of this, before we get to the Gargano match in Portland, Portland already looks fucking amazing, spoiler alert, I want to see a match in the middle between Finn Balor and Tyler Bate. And I thought that, when, when they started referencing that the, the ruckus at Worlds Collide, I thought we were going to get Balor versus Bate. Seven is great. Bate is is the guy he's the jeff hardy of the team now that's me and that's most north american audiences all due respect to the uk audience that know these guys way 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 better than i do and probably have a greater uh a greater grasp on the respect we should have for trent seven and as i say nothing against him i need to see balor versus bait at some point before we get to balor versus gargano at portland because at this point Actually, no, that's not true, because we already knew who the women's contender was. I was about to say, this is the only match we have announced for Portland at this point in the night, but that's not true. Bianca Belair is getting another shot at the Don't Call It the NXT Women's Championship and Rhea Ripley. Um, we see Riddle and Dunn in the back discussing the, the main event tonight, which is the finals of the Dusty Classic. Roddy, Roddy, Rock. It's all good. It's the whole, aren't they a funny, odd couple, Dunn's all serious... Uh, riddles very very not serious and you know look at look at my buddy Pete there my bro from another mo and that's his that's his happy face and yeah it is what it is um the other big story going into tonight was the uh the the big grudge match between uh, Dakota Kai and Tegan Knox so we had a little bit of a video package on Dakota Kai turning on Tegan Knox at war games slamming her leg into the into the um I was going to do the whole Bret Hart thing, slamming her leg into her leg, but that really doesn't work either. 
slamming her leg in the War Games cage. That's how we get there. And I thought we were going to have the match right then and there, which would have been a bummer, because it should be a main event. They should have saved this a week. It should have been the main event next week. But when you see what we get later on, I might take my... I might take my... my uh, opinion. That's the word I'm looking for. I might take my opinion back there. But what we get instead is Deanna Perrazzo taking on my girl Shotzi Blackheart, who, for reasons... Came to the ring in a fucking tank. Oh, yes. And not a big, you know, serious DX were invading WCW and it's just a knockoff. Like what's-his-face from AEW, Mr. Irrelevancy, Mr. I'm Jericho's little son, whatever the fuck his name is, going in a toy tank to, what was it, Rumble or Worlds Collide or one of the things that happened this weekend. Nice little publicity stunt and you can't even come up with your own publicity stunt. That's fine. That's wonderful. They're going to be whipping each other this week and they're not even on a boat. So I don't know why I'm talking about AEW. But Shotzi Blackheart comes out in a mini tank. Fucking awesome. TCB on the front. She runs it right into the side of the, of the ring apron. It's all... Shotzi Blackheart's just fucking good. I told you guys. I told you guys. And she's taking on Deanna Perrazzo, who's no slouch in her own right. Now, more... Um, you know them if you know them, you don't know them if you don't know them. That's the most ridiculous thing for me to say ever. But I'm pretty sure on the worldwide stage more people know Deanna Perrazzo than Shotzi Blackheart. And yes, my bias is seeping through and it's bright green. But color and elbow type start and Perrazzo works on the arm of the grounded arm bar. Arm dragged by Shotzi, Inseguri off the ropes, a snapmare by Perrazzo, a knee... What the fuck is up with my writing tonight? Knee, knee, oh, knee dropping on the arm because she's working into the arm bar. The virtuoso of the arm bar, yes, yes, I brought myself back on track there. Don't mind me, I'm tired, it's fine. Lariat by Perrazzo and a double jawbreaker by Shotzi, followed by a neckbreaker, corner splash by Shotzi, reverse sling blade bulldog type thing by Shotzi, a pump kick by Perrazzo, but a recoil and a senton splash by Shotzi. Get the win for Shotzi Blackheart, who leaves in her tank because she can. Shotzi Blackheart is awesome. We replay more detailed highlights from last week of Keith Lee winning the North American Championship, which is great. And then we see highlights from Worlds Collide, which was also a lot of, of fun. I don't really know what to say about the main event and the injury that happened to Aleister Black. Um, there was a lot of stuff out there. Conversations I wasn't even in. People just like tagged me in them after the fact. And said, like, hey Spaz, I thought this would give you a laugh. And it was a bunch of... I'll be polite and say advocates, you know, people that were uh, upset at the reaction to the pay-per-view. Because people were saying, you know, don't pick on Undisputed Era, this kind of thing happens, you know. Alexander Wolf himself came out and said, hey, it was my fault, I didn't tuck my chin properly. Uh, don't blame anybody else, I take the blame on me. And everybody came out and said, oh yeah, but when it was, uh, when it was Sasha Banks, you know, you guys all picked on her. Well, first of all, Sasha Banks is fucking useless. Uh, Undisputed Era is definitely not useless. Second of all, in this particular scenario, the person that got hurt is admitting what they themselves did wrong to cause this situation. Not the same at all. And I'm pretty sure Alexander Wolf will be back in a couple of weeks, and Paige is still in that category of Daniel Bryan, Edge, Paige, what if scenarios. There was rumors she was going to come back at the Rumble. That's not necessarily the case, so apparently she's not cleared yet, and that's because of Sasha Banks. Moving on, if, if, you, if you have any questions on why those two are different, other than the fact that they are completely different, let me just put that out there. But uh, Worlds Collide as a whole was, it was, it was good. Tony Storm versus Rhea Ripley, either there was something wrong with one of them, or their match got cut really short for time, because that match was not not what I wanted it to be. Now, I don't watch NXT UK on a regular basis. You guys know I used to. You guys know I used to review it. And we've seen this rivalry, granted with the roles reversed, we've seen this rivalry in NXT UK coming off the back out, <sighs> coming off the back of the Mae Young Classic. Uh, this was not that. Um, not at all. Uh, Balor put on a hell of a show for Ilya Dragunov to put on a hell of his own show. That was good. The Cruiserweight Championship we're going to talk about later on. The tag match was the match of the night. And it just, uh, I mean, again, Mia Yim and, and Kaylee Ray got bumped to the pre-show, which is bad for a bunch of reasons. Kaylee Ray shouldn't be on the pre-show. Mia Yim, in my opinion, even though most people won't give her her due, shouldn't be on the pre-show. And when you're showing, when you're showcasing a battle between two brands, 
I know I know it ended up not being a title match, but it was essentially um, you had a cruiserweight title match, you had an NXT women's title match, and you had an NXT UK women's title match. The only title that got bumped to the pre-show was the UK title, and the UK brand is what needed to get the push here. NXT proper, we already know, is the best thing on TV. NXT proper's women's division is definitely the best thing you're going to find on wrestling television. I'm sorry. Put it down in the box below so I can laugh at you if you don't agree, but it is what it is. Uh, bumping their only UK champion other than Walter to the pre-show was a bad move. And, I'm sorry, even, even though we have a great match to talk about tonight, and we are going to talk about it, bumping the finals of the Dusty Classic to the next week on NXT was also a bad move, in my opinion. If you didn't hear my preview with Jake, we went into uh, quite a bit of detail about that, and every reason why this, this should have been part of that card, especially because it is the Worlds Collide card, because it's the NXT UK tag teams involved in the tournament, and you knew one of them was going to make it to the finals. Um... But two, two really bad moves there, in my opinion, on, on what ended up being a pretty damn fun show. Now, they say this is going to be a franchise in its own right, so the term Worlds Collide is going to become like the term TakeOver, I guess. So my, my criticism of why didn't you just call it TakeOver Worlds Collide doesn't really hold water anymore because apparently Worlds Collide is going to be its own separate type of event. It's going to be like Super Showdown. We don't need to talk about it. It's fine. Keith Lee comes out and says, yes, greetings, I am Keith Lee, your, limit, your new reigning, defending, limitless NXT North American champion. Talks about his journey through the Undisputed Era to get to the North American Championship title shot. He says, I'm a prophecy ender, and I'm going to talk, tell you the next thing that's on the agenda. He doesn't get to say what the next thing on the agenda is, though, because he's interrupted by Damian Priest. And immediately, my interest is piqued because I like Damian Priest. I think Damian Priest is another one of those guys on NXT that I think a lot of people are sleeping on. Not saying Buddy Stretch of the Imagination is the best thing on the show, but I like his gimmick. It's really fun. It's got I, I always say it. It's got that old Brandon Lee Crow uh, vibe to it, and it just works. The entrance works. The the uh, the dark the dark entrance where he's got the ar the Archer of Infamy and he's got the big flames on the ceiling and on the Tron and everything. It just it just works. He says, I don't know if you know this about me, but I like taking things. I don't care whether it's your your women, your happiness, or your possessions. I get what I want, and how are you going to give that to me? Pretty, pretty simple premise. I like to take things. You have a thing I want to take. It's good. And then Dominic Dijakovic comes out, and all my interest in this segment goes, I'm sorry, right into the toilet. He comes out. He says some stuff. He makes some really bad joke about Damian Priest being a Marilyn Man a bootleg Marilyn Manson. I that's a tryhard. That's a tryhard. Um, Keith Lee leaves. He basically says, "It looks like you guys have some stuff to talk about," and he goes to leave. And uh, the other two just start fighting, and that's how you get a match in NXT today. I'm losing my page. That's fine. Don't mind that. But. Uh, yeah, we basically sort of fumble our way into a match. There's corner elbows by Dijak and a backbreaker and a splash. They trade some shots on the outside, and there's a crucifix bomb on the apron by Priest, which was a nice, nice move. There's a commercial. We come back from the commercial break. There's a series of strikes by Dijak and a toss across the ring. Bell clap by Priest and a series of smash, uh, series of strikes and a flatliner. Uh, choke bomb by Dijak. He goes to do the feast your eyes thing, and it gets countered, but it doesn't get countered so much that he doesn't still have him in a choke position. Uh, moonsault to the outside by Dijak, which is impressive. He's a big dude. He's a big athlete dude I just a I don't care because he hasn't given me a reason to care and B I don't care because they're fighting for the chance to fight Keith Lee and we've already seen Dijak versus Keith Lee a billion times and the only time it was interesting was when you threw in Roderick Strong who's now out of the equation choke slam off the top rope by priest and the suicide sent on now I will say the choke slam off the top by priest did help sort of um, even the playing field in the in the fans' eyes, because Damian Priest is no small dude, but in there with Dijak, he is seen as the smaller dude. So for him to pull off a power move like a choke slam off the top, sort of reset the uh, reset the calibration of the match, followed by the suicide senton, which is just it's just great. It falls under that dive category, doesn't it? They, they had a dual spin kick, and for a moment I thought, well, shit, it's going to be a ten count. 
they're going to both be counted out with this stupid double knockout spot. We're going to get a triple threat match like we had before, except this time Roderick Strong is replaced by Damian Priest. I just want Damian Priest versus Keith Lee one-on-one. -on -one. You immediately piqued my interest with that, and then you watered it down with Dijak. There's a super kick by Dijak and a top rope poison Rana by Priest that should have won the match, but it didn't because Dijak doesn't sell shit. Stands up, hits the feast your eyes, and Dijak gets the win. It's, it's, it's a Bianca Belair situation, kind of, because the guy's great in the ring. He's obviously great in the ring. He's a great athlete. Um, I just don't care. I mean, with Bianca Belair, it's the fact that the way she's written legitimately irks me, and I don't think it's very flattering to her, and I, and I think the hair thing is stupid, and we can talk about those spots in the Rumble that she won because she's got a ponytail, but we're not going to do that. She irritates me. Dominic Dijakovic does something worse than irritate me. He makes me not care. And he makes me not care, despite the fact that I know he's a great athlete and he's a talented guy in the ring. And that is saying something in a really, really bad way. We, um... We see the Grizzled Young Vets getting ready in the back. They don't really have an interview, but sort of interspersed with them getting ready is little clip shots of how they got there. They did the same thing with Dunn and Riddle later on. But Champa is in the back and he's being interviewed and he says one way or another I'm uh, one way or another Goldie's coming home in Portland and we go to commercial break immediately when we come back from commercial break we show the arena but we show the arena watching the Tron and then that just sort of becomes you know when they do that thing where it's the arena watching the Tron and then the Tron eventually becomes what's actually on your TV and it's just a hallway with the other three members of the Undisputed Era laid out because Tommaso Ciampa, in the interview part before, had a pipe and he was banging it up against things. So I have a pipe and you don't believe me, I don't have anything metal to do this with, but you don't believe me that I have a pipe unless I go like this against something. Which is fine, he took a bunch of people out and it's all good. And I lost my spot. I lost my spot in my notes again. Um, after the commercial, we see them all taken out. They're in the hallway. I'm sorry, guys. I really just had an entire brain fart right there. He comes to the ring, but he doesn't really come to the ring. He comes to the ring with a table. He comes to the ring with a table and a can of yellow spray paint. Cole sees it, sees what he's done to his friends, comes out to the ring too, and uh, Ciampa basically wails out. They don't really cut a promo. They just kind of shout at each other. He's like, I know, he, but he brings the title, or sorry, he brings the table, I can speak, I swear. He brings the table and the and the spray paint into the ring, sets up the table, puts a big yellow X on the table because the, the symbolism is really heavy-handed. Um, he says, I never lost that title. I'm Goldie's daddy. I'm the one that's going to whip your ass. I'm the one that's going to put your table, your ass through the table tonight. Then I'm going to sign a contract, and I'm going to get my life back, and I'm going to get my title back, and Goldie's coming home. It's all good and fine. William Regal, as he comes on the stage, is basically like, but, like, Adam Cole just finished talking to me. Adam Cole doesn't care who he faces in Portland. This match is already happening. <laughs> and it's just one of those regals looking at him, and, and it's great. Because I don't think you would get this on the main roster, or at least it wouldn't come off as well. But he's just looking at him, not mad, not like he's going to discipline him. He's just looking at him like, what the fuck are you doing? You've already got the match. It's great. I mean, you want, you want to say that it's been spoiled, right? But... I'm going to draw another comparison to AEW here. I really am. Because uh, John Moxley is, as far as I know anyway, as far as I've kept up, he's the number one contender for Jericho. Now, they set up the story between him and Jericho so that it was perfectly obvious that the match at Revolution, you know, the name that they stole from NXT, um, is going to be Jericho versus Moxley. So they set that story in motion and then put a number one contenders match together where you knew who was going to win. But it's on a boat, so it's okay. No, anyways, here, Ciampa is is sort of like working towards the match. He's pushing towards the match, and William Regal literally is the voice of the audience here, saying, "Look, we we know that you already have the match. We know that you're the one that Regal was going to announce." Regal comes out and says, "Look, you've already got the match. Like, what the hell?" Cole's pissed off. I'm Adam Cole. I'm the champion, whether you like it or not. He attacks Ciampa with a mic. Ciampa puts Cole through the table. And then he grabs the contract from, from Regal. And there's a bit of a thing here. There's a bit of a, I miss things when I'm watching TV sometimes. And obviously I'm not in the full sale audience. So they see things before we see them on screen. And it took me back to the contract signing before the Royal Rumble between the, the Fiend and Daniel Bryan. And, you know, the Fiend stabbed himself in the hand and whatever. And 
and he signed the contract in, in the blood. And it was all very, look at me, aren't I a scary movie character? I like The Fiend, but they're really fucking him up. And the Daniel Bryan thing isn't even exciting at this point. I'm sorry. These are two guys in a feud that I really like, that I should be into, because I like the fucked up shit. If you saw my movie collection, you would know that a character like The Fiend is right up my street. But... They, they fucked that up, and the, the contract thing, when he, when he stabbed himself in the hand, he put the handprint down. But in this case, the crowd started, as he was beating up Cole, the crowd started chanting, like, sign, use his blood, you know, sign it in his own blood, whatever the case may be. And I'm like, oh, come on, guys. You want this to be, like, main roster stuff? But then I realized that it wasn't Adam Cole that was bleeding. It was Tommaso Ciampa that was bleeding. And that he was going to sign it in his own blood because, like, haha the top of my head is bleeding, isn't that hilarious? He goes, he has a pen, he's gonna sign it, but he, I don't know whether this was planned or not. If it wasn't planned, good for him. But he just sort of like touches the top of his head and goes on the contract, and that's fucking brilliant. And he throws it down on Adam Cole, who's still <coughs> laying in the uh, in the broken pieces of the table that he had put the X on. And the X is great, because you know the whole X marks the spot thing, you know, the yellow, because it's the NXT brand, but it's also... The yellow X is is emblematic of that actual physical title belt. It's emblematic of Goldie itself, which is fucking brilliant. It works on every level, and if the blood thing was done on the fly, that's even better. I don't know whether it was or not. I'm not gonna pretend that I that I know things that I don't know, but it was it was good. We replay Jordan Devlin winning the Cruiserweight Championship. Now I pop for this because this was something, again. Again, I want to send out a, a really big shout out to Jake DeMarco, who joined me for the Worlds Collide preview. It was a lot of fun, hoping to get him back on soon. But we did talk about Jordan Devlin winning. Not only, not only because it was a title that was suited for him, not only because I personally want to see Devlin versus Rush for the title, but because of what it means for the brand. It means um, the Cruiserweight Championship gets represented over in the UK or he can come over and defend it here, and he's representing the UK brand. It does a lot of good things. Didn't think it was going to happen. I thought it was going to be a showcase and Garza was going to retain. Especially, especially when Triple H and William Regal came up on WWE.com and WWE's Twitter handle and gave him the new belt. Now, it's not perfect. It's not perfect because it is silver on black, which is what we wanted. We got rid of the purple that made it look silly. Now, there are flecks of purple in the silver of of the belt plate and i didn't like that at first because i'm like ah, oh, you didn't fully commit to it but it does harken back to the fact that it does it does recognize the belt that preceded it it does rep um it does recognize the event that that created it which was the cruiserweight classic which we all unanimously loved i reviewed it on this channel go back there's a playlist i think um and it does pay a little bit of homage to 205 Live. Even though 205 Live, most people consider it a fail experiment, it is part of the history of that belt. So if you want to have the silver on the black, which is what we wanted, and have little flecks of the purple in there just to represent where it's come from to where it is now, I'm getting to be okay with it. I really, really am. But they presented the brand new belt to, uh, to Garza for him to lose it that night, and he lost it to Jordan Devlin. Um, it was a great match. I mean, Garza versus Swerve. I knew it was just going to be a showcase for Swerve. We met, we talked about this on the preview as well. Um, I would love to see Swerve get in the North American title picture. Now, if Damian Priest were to take that belt off Keith Lee, I think you then do Damian Priest versus Isaiah Swerve Scott and have them feud over that belt for a while. Keith Lee is going to use that belt as a stepping stone. He's going to use it as a stepping stone to eventually facing either Adam Cole or Tommaso Ciampa after, after Portland. That's the way I think. He's going to do the plan C, the, the Austin Aries plan C thing, isn't he? But, um, but if it goes to Priest and then Priest defends it against Swerve, I see that, I see that going a lot better. Now you've got Garza, you've got Devlin over from the UK, you've got Travis Banks, the only Banks in WWE that matters. Uh, he's in that mix too now, so if he's going to cross over and be part of this new, uh, Across the pond, uh, shared universe <laughs> NXT cruiserweight division. That's all, all, all good too. Like, Travis Banks is awesome. Jordan Devlin is a fucking star. Jordan Devlin, yes, he was trained by Finn Balor, but he's literally mini Finn Balor. Like with the with the charisma, with the heel tendencies. It's just we've never had to see him as a face. Like he was he was dickbag Finn Balor before Finn Balor was. Now I know Prince Devitt, it, it, he existed 
on the indies and over in Japan, whatever, I haven't seen Finn Balor until Finn Balor showed up in NXT the first time. So this is my first opportunity recently to see him as a heel. I think Jordan Devlin, his protege for all intents and purposes, being a dickbag heel all along was the precursor to me appreciating Finn Balor as much as he is right now. But Jordan Devlin is the champion, and we're going to get... Wait a minute, what are we going to get? Because Garza technically has a rematch. The, the thing of a multi-person match is you can go in with a heel champion and come out with a different heel champion because there were baby faces in the mix. You could have Garza versus Devlin just like in one of those like who's a bigger dickhead matches. Like um, I always use the example of if you ever did uh, Guerrero versus Flair, you know, it's the dirtiest player in the game versus lie, cheat, and steal, and it's still fun. I don't, like, there's two very different kinds of ego and cockiness from Garza and Devlin. That could be a really interesting mix, but I really want Devlin to keep it now. Put it back on Garza later on down the line. That's fine. Then I can say, you know, he took off his pants for reasons. It's great. Um, but I really do. I really, for some reason, I really do want that Jordan Devlin-Leo Rush match. I don't know what Leo Rush is doing right now, because he wasn't at Worlds Collide. So that's interesting. We get Tegan Knox versus Dakota Kai, which was supposed to be a big, huge, grudge feud match. I think this should have main evented NXT because I think the main event of tonight should have been on the weekend, or they could have pushed this by week or whatever. They did. <sighs> what did they do? They disappointed me in this match a little bit because I think they're leading up to this match happening again at the pay-per-view, which I say is awesome, but... We're doing a match to get to a match. Um, Tegan Knox, Dakota Kai. Dakota Kai's entrance is the War Games footage again, where it's uh, Tegan Knox's own screaming over T uh, Dakota Kai's new music, which is which is great. It's a great psychological thing, and both of them, from a character point of view, are selling it great. Uh, Knox is bringing her brace to the ring. There's some symbolism there. There's some shots, some corner spears. A sorry. I lost my train of thought once again. Fuck me. I am really tired. Please bear with me. Knox brings her brace to the ring, tosses it towards Dakota Kai as a distraction, hits her with some shots, some corner spears, a back elbow by Kai, and a corner senton by Knox. Kai stomps the leg on the outside as they brawl through the crowd. And I thought this is how they were going to get to their match at the pay-per-view, they were going to get counted out, but they didn't. Pump kick by Kai on the ramp. Kai eats the post face first, misses with the brace shot, so there's no disqualification. Back suplex by Knox. Kai goes for a chair. Candice LeRae on the outside causes a distraction, causes a distraction to the referee by taking the chair away from Dakota Kai. While she's distracted, Tegan Knox, the baby face, smacks her in the face with her knee brace, hits the Shining Wizard, and gets the win. Now, this is one of those things where we feel so bad for Tegan Knox, we don't care what depths she has to go to to get the win. But this is still a baby face winning by really, really healy means, the same really healy means that the heel in the match tried to do. So, it's that I came into this match wanting to be a dick. This other person that got involved, in this case, Candice LeRae, didn't let me be a dick. So it let the person who's not a dick beat me by being a dick. There's a lot of dick in that, and, uh, you know, there's more dick in that last analogy than there is in Sasha Banks. Anyways, um... It wasn't great. I, I'm excited to see where it goes. I was paying attention to it all the way through because I want to see how we get to the pay-per-view match that we're clearly getting now. But it, standing alone on its own right, it wasn't great. It, it just wasn't. Chelsea Green with Robert Stone, because she's part of the Robert Stone brand, don't you know? Versus Caden Carter, who can't buy a win to save her life, even though she's also awesome. Dropkick by Carter, a hangman by Green, and a kick to the head, a dropkick by Green, a boot and hard iron sweep, a butterfly stretch, and a curb stomp to the bottom, turnbuckle by Green, side headlock by Green, a super kick by Carter, a boot by Green, but after the boot, she taunts the crowd, which gives Carter the opening to do the roll-up. Uh, I'm going to do the whole Simon Miller thing. She hit her with the most devastating move in all of sports entertainment, the surprise roll-up. And Caden Carter finally gets a win, which sucks in a way because I think the crowd's really, really behind her and they want her to succeed, but they don't want her to succeed off the stupidity of her opponent. And if this is supposed to be Chelsea... Chelsea Green is, is Zack Ryder's lady, isn't she? She's with Robbie E. And that's just weird. And Joaquin Wilde is, uh, is DJZ. DJZ and Robbie E... Go back to anything that they did in TNA and tell me that you thought they would be where they are now. Rob, Robbie E is now the Robert Stone brand, and, and Joaquin Wilde 
Walking Wild is just dead because Finn Balor killed him last week. That's, uh, I don't even know what to say about that, honestly. The Dusty Cup final. The Broserweights of Pete Dunne and Matt Riddle versus the grizzled young veterans James Drake and Liverpool's number one, Zach Gibson. I shouldn't do the, the impression thing. I know, I get it. Dunne and Drake start the match with the collar in about time. Dunne works the head, the arm, and the fingers. Uh, I cannot read my writing. Dunne and Riddle uh, double stomp the hands, ankle lock by Riddle, clothesline by Gibson, corner forearms and a mud hole stomp, a series of kicks by Riddle, gut wrench suplex by Riddle. Riddle's gut wrench suplex is like surprisingly awkward looking every time. I, I, I'm, I know it's intentional. I'm not saying he's botching it or anything like that. It's surprisingly awkward looking every time he does it. And I don't know how to pronounce or how to describe it any better than that. Double tombstone spot on the floor by Grizzled Young Veterans on Pete Dunn. Chops by Dunn. Dunn eats the post shoulder first. So his head's fucked. His neck's fucked. His shoulder's fucked. He's having a great old time. We get back from the commercial break and he's okay enough to hit an X-Plex on, uh, on James Drake. Kicks in a Pele kick by Riddle. Uh, Broton, a penalty kick, an Everest German suplex, and a spear. Bro hammer. But this whole thing between him and Goldberg and now this whole thing between him and Lesnar just makes me smile because like it's the most legitimate version of Riddle just doesn't give a single single fuck and it's great trip by Drake and a low basement drop kick by Gibson all four of them get in the ring uh, kicks for everybody by Riddle and Donna powerbomb and knee strike combination by Riddle followed by a broton uh, goes to the pin doesn't get it DDT by Drake body shots by Dunn and a snap German Dunn snaps the forearms there's a double ankle lock spot both Dunn and Riddle putting on stereo ankle locks is a lot of fun face buster by Drake a lariat by Gibson a side chin lock by Drake, a Ticket to Ride, by Gibson, a Shankly Gates. I like the Shankly Gates, by the way, because it's a one-arm Boston Crab, but it's the reverse of that. And it's, again, it doesn't look like, it doesn't look like anything else. It looks awkward enough that I really, I mean, it goes without saying, it looks awkward enough that I don't want to be in that, but I don't want to be in anything. I don't want to be in a figure eight or a, or a sharpshooter or an ankle lock or, or any of those things. But the Shankly Gates is on the top of the list right now. And then everything I have at the end of this match is a, is a huge, huge bullet point. Riddle spears Gibson to break up the Shankly Gates, but he spears Gibson with Drake on his back. So his spear isn't a typical like run across the ring spear. It's a slow moving tank with, a, with another human being on top of him, which is great. Riddle and Dunn double power bomb Drake onto Gibson. There's some finger snapping and I guess what the, the bitter end followed by the, the knee strike by Riddle, they're calling it the Riddle end which is, is predictable and a little bit WWE, but okay. Doomsday Suicide Dive by Grizzled Young Veterans on Dunn. Double Tombstone Spot with um, with Pete Dunn and Matt Riddle. I mean, Matt Riddle actually hits the, uh, the bro Derek, but it comes from the same position as the Tombstone, so it looks like they're doing stereo Tombstones, which is good. Double Moonsaults to the inside and the outside by Riddle and Dunn. Uh, Pop-up Double Knee Kick by Dunn and Riddle, and that is that. You have your 2020 Dusty Rhodes Tag Team Classic Invitational thing winners, and it is the Broserweights, it is Pete Dunne, it is Matt Riddle following in the steps of Ricochet and Aleister Black, and following in the steps of the inaugural winners, uh, Finn Balor and Samoa Joe. The thrown together teams usually win. Now, that's not necessarily always true because the Office of Pain did win it, and the Undisputed Era did win it, but they won it by still throwing a team together within the match. Because if you remember that, that's Roderick Strong t uh, turning on Pete Dunne. Pete Dunne goes back into the into the Dusty Classic. I almost said Cruiserweight Classic there because I'm an idiot. He goes back into the Dusty Classic a second time with another partner and makes good on getting screwed over by his last partner a couple of years ago. And that partner that screwed him over is part of the Undisputed Era, part of the Undisputed Era, who these guys now get to face at Portland for the Tag Team Championships, and that is interwoven storytelling, and that is interwoven storytelling in Tag Team Wrestling that everybody on the AEW side of things wants to say that WWE doesn't have, and that's, that's fucking wonderful. Not only is that a great match, not only did the Grizzled Young Veterans make a fan-fucking-tastic showing of themselves, and if they stay over on main roster NXT, I'll be happy with that as well. We set up 
another match for Portland. So let's talk about Portland for a second. We've got Dunn and Riddle versus Fish and O'Reilly for the Tag Team Championships. We've got Ripley versus Bel Air, which is kind of eh for the Don't Call It NXT Women's Championship. We've got Gargano versus Balor because it's Gargano and Balor. And we've got Ciampa versus Cole for the NXT title where those two guys are going to kill each other. I, I, you really don't need it. it it's not hard. It's NXT, it's not hard, we don't need boats, and dinosaurs, and aliens, and cults, and, and just just do some really, really kick-ass wrestling, have, have a women's division that you could beat AEW over the head with, show that you can do enough good tag team wrestling in your own right, and build to multiple pay-per-views at a time. Since the beginning of 2020, we are 29 days into 2020, and this brand has put on, or helped put on, NXT UK TakeOver Blackpool 2. They have helped put on Worlds Collide, bringing NXT UK along for the ride. They made more than their fair share of an impact in the Royal Rumble, and in two and a bit weeks, they're actually doing their own first pay-per-view of the year, and they're already four pay-per-views deep. And, and then, yeah, oh, and we've got Revolution on the other side of things, because they couldn't even come up with their own pay-per-view name. Oh, yes. I've been Spaz, your YWC Reality Check. Subscribe up there, talk down there, start a conversation. Keep all these conversations going. Don't be a stranger. I will talk to each and every last one of you later, but for right now, I am tagging out. Bye, guys.